We are, my name is Grant Calton. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Omniverse Vision, which is a producer and distributor of event cinema, aka alternative content uh, based in London. We uh, formed in 2010. Uh, and since then, we've had a lot of fun and some good success putting uh, bands like Led Zeppelin, Chemical Brothers, Beatles, Rolling Stones, Ozzy Osbourne, Bon Jovi on cinema screens around the world. Sitting to my right is Kimberly Frey Owens, who's the first lady of event cinema in, uh, in the US. Uh, Kimberly's Hi, everyone. Event. So I handle all the music and um, alternative content as far as arts and entertainment for Fathom and work closely with Grant to do a push-pull strategy from international content coming to the U.S. and then U.S. content going internationally. And John Ruby on my right is the, Hi. Uh, is the CEO of Ruby Entertainment. He's a man who knows all about putting rock and roll on the big screen, making it immersive and, uh, and uh, making it jump out at you and making you jump into the screen. It's nice to be with all of you uh, this morning. I was uh, previously at AEG Live and uh, now form my own company to continue the uh, wild ride and uh, all the fun we've been having, um, including um, spectacular music events uh, in cinemas. What we do specifically is we produce them, we finance them, we deliver them, and we market them uh, to audiences uh, here in the United States and Canada and around the world. Thank you, John. Um, just, I just want to give you a kind of a bit of a rundown on what Event Cinema is and, and how it's come to be. So Event Cinema, which some of you may also know as alternative content, is basically content that goes into cinemas that is live events, special events, a lot of cultural content, opera, ballet, uh, even muse museum exhibitions are going into cinemas now. But most importantly for us here, it's about, it's about music, it's about rock music. Um, the, the sort of genesis of it, there, there's, there's two sort of key points, and John brought one up this morning, which I, I wasn't actually aware of, which was one of the first events, I think the first event that he did live in cinema was the Rolling Rock Festival uh, in 2000, which uh, had um, guys like uh, Moby, Fuel... Fuel, Filter, Filter. and uh, Chili Peppers were the headliner. And that was the first time that a, a live rock concert had gone via satellite. It went into a small footprint of about 10 a AMC theatres. Um, in, in my kind of textbook of it, um, ever the innovator David Bowie did from London a live Q&A on the reality tour from a place called Riverside Studios, which went into about 300 cinemas around Europe. So that's kind of what event cinema is uh, in terms of the content. How, how it came to be, it's very much about technology. Digital technology into cinemas has, has meant that uh, no longer do you have to ship around cans of film, but you can stick a little hard disk into a FedEx pack, you can send stuff via satellite, as we've just touched on. You can send it via broadband. You can send it via fiber optic. So the, the point there being that distribution has become easy and cheap. There's also, um, I think, the other reason, which is a commercial one, which Kimberly knows a lot about, is the fact that cinemas, and in the UK, I think the industry says that the average occupancy rate for a cinema across the, across the whole week is around about 19%. So there's a lot of empty inventory to be leveraged uh, in cinemas. Uh, perhaps you'd just tell us a little bit about sure. Fathom and the Monday to Thursday model and how that works. So, you know, we were really um, a part of Regal Entertainment Group back in 1997. Regal saw a vision where they saw a lot of the theaters sitting empty during the weeknights. And they said, how do we really take what we have, the asset of the movie theater and the big screen, and create something that would draft new audiences to cinema? So they basically created an alternative content group and started working on smaller projects that were going out to maybe 10, 20 theaters around the country. The other circuits liked what they were doing so much that we spun off and became a part of what was then NCM Fathom so that we could get the big three together and aggregate all the assets from AMC, Regal, Cinemark, plus all of our affiliates that come on board to take alternative content and create a massive scale across the country. Today we have roughly 780 live theaters that are equipped live for host theaters for Fathom, and we have about 1,400 um, promotional theaters and 14,000 screens. So if we do an event in New York, for example, we may only go out to five or six theaters with that event, but all 70 theaters in the New York DMA will help promote that event and drive consumers to that content. Um, so it was a brilliant strategy. We've been very successful. I think the thing that put us on the map was probably the Metropolitan Opera. 
Um, and that really drove consumers that would normally not go to a movie theater, quite honestly. They were aging out of content. Hollywood wasn't really making anything that resonated with the senior audience. And we saw what it could do for the Met. And it truly was all boats rise. The Met audience um, in New York started coming back and we were exposing new audiences across the country to the Met. How many of you have been <coughs> to a, a yeah. Fathom event in the room? Anybody? Yay, thank wow. you. Thanks. Um, and I hope it was a good experience, and we'll talk about that, and I'd like to hear about those experiences in Q&A. So, so just to put a bit of perspective on how the phrase event cinema um, came to be. So the, the traditional model of distributing films has been uh, a, mo a movie goes into a cinema, uh, it runs for multiple weeks until, there's, until they've soaked up all the demand. Um, so now with event cinema, what we do, it's, it's about uh, focusing on a date. It's, it's about getting people to make a commitment to go and see a movie on a specific day, so it becomes an event. Um, and the idea there being, obviously, is that we, we want to try and get full rooms. We don't want to have a thousand people going to ten different screenings. We want those thousand people going to one screening. I think um, the... Yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to say, the other thing that's important about the date that uh, Grant just mentioned is that that date will normally uh, coincide with an initiative that the artist has. They have a tour going on sale, they have a new CD being released, or there's something other important happening from the artist's perspective. So what you have is you have all of the artist's assets, the promoter's assets, and uh, the cinema's assets all coinciding on a focal point that's very important to the fan base and uh, to everyone's collective marketing interests. And so that's what makes a, a successful uh, event and promotion. And we start promotions about 30 days <coughs> prior to that street date. So if you're at a movie theater and you see the Fathom event trailers, um, talking about the upcoming program, that runs for about 30 days. So this, this slide here just gives you an overview of how many digital screens there are in the world. Just for those of you who are not familiar, there's, there's around about 120,000 screen, cinema screens in the world that equate to somewhere in the region of 15,000 actual locations, cinema locations. As you can see, as of the end of last year, just a little over 100,000 of those are now digital. So that's kind of pretty much most of it. Um, and then in terms of event cinema and, and, and what it is as a market, the august British journal, IHC Screen Digest, um, have called $750 million uh, currently as the box office value of event cinema rising to about a billion uh, by 2017, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's have a bit of a look through at some of the examples of uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing both individually and together over the last, over the last few years. So uh, at the top there we've got Bon Jovi, the Circle Tour. That's something that we, all three of us, worked on. So how that worked is that my company took the uh, international theatrical rights from, from John's company, and John worked with uh, Kimberly for Fathom for the US. So it was, a, a, it was a nice kind of like circle, the dots joined up, and we were able to share all the promotional assets, trailers, poster art, and obviously uh, modify them for the, for the particular territories. One other thing that's important to point out about Bon Jovi is that uh, over eight years, Bon Jovi uh, produced and distributed more than six uh, live and pre-recorded cinema events for different initiatives and tours, uh, two of which I believe contributed to the Billboard Top Selling Tour of the Year. Perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about the Crossroads show? Sure. So this one um, we do when Eric Clapton performs his Crossroads program. The last one was this summer. We worked with, anybody in the room know John Bug. Um, so we work with John to collaborate on bringing the best of Crossroads. As you know, it's a festival that takes place over an entire weekend. So we really narrow it down and create... No mobile phones, John. Yeah. Really Excuse me. <laughs> narrow it down and create a, a two-hour event. Um, and the, you know, the continuity is Eric Clapton on stage and performing with some of the other great artists that are honoring him. Um, it's a perennial for us, and well, not a perennial, but every three years we do this. And we found that from event one to event two, um, we've really been able to hold the audience and draft an uptick in audience. So uh, Led Zeppelin Celebration Day, that was one that we did. That, that was a, an interesting one, something with slow burner. Some of you may know that Led Zeppelin reformed to do a one-off show in 2007 at the O2 in London. Uh, it was kind of famous because 22 million people applied for 18,000 tickets. 
And uh, we knew that the show had been filmed because we knew the director. And uh, somewhere about the beginning of 2011, we, we started talking. We, 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 we just got going, uh, released a couple of films, and we started talking and saying, hey, this, this could be huge. This could be an absolute perfect event cinema show. At the time, I think Robert Plant and uh, Jimmy Page weren't talking to each other, so they didn't want to do anything with it. So it was around about 18 months later that we actually got, got something done, and we took that, in, that out into about 2,000 cinemas around the world. Um, and we, we focused it on one day working with Kimberley in the US. It was October the 17th. Um, and then over that day, and then on course greetings, which, which slotted in over the next both week and, and then in other kind of more far flung territories the next few months, we did about just over $5 million of box office on that. And something that Grant said is really important. A lot of times, you know, it, it looks like magic that something falls in our lap and we put it up on a screen, but some of these projects, we're working four, five, six years in advance, identifying what's really going to make really great event cinema, building the relationship with the talent, with management, with anybody who's involved, and waiting for the right time to really release this in cinema. So. Any idea to us, um, I think collectively I could speak for the group, is a good one. It may not be the perfect time at this, this point in time, but we build those relationships so that when it is, we've got that relationship going and that conduit of, of <coughs> being able to take it to theaters. Well, and, and you're here at South by Southwest, and so you're as part of a music panel, and so you're in the music business, and you clearly understand what relationships are about and how you grow a relationship and an understanding with an artist so that you know that at the right time in that artist's career and your collective relationship that uh, you're able to, as Kimberly says, you know, activate those levers and, and make something very special happen. Just, just out of interest, a, a brief break, how many people here are artists and musicians? And, and how many people are, are, say, record company marketing music industry? Okay, I wonder what everyone else does. Anyway, later. promoters. Any <laughs> promoters? <laughs> Are there any students? Great, terrific. So, so Muse briefly. That Muse was the first uh, first 4K concert um, or first film rock film shot in 4K. Again, it was a slow burner. We'd originally going to be we were going to do the, a live show from London for the release of the Second Law in September 2012. Um, it was we spent five months setting it up, and then, <laughs> in great record company style, they decided to change the release date, and everything fell apart. <clears throat> so it was a, a year later that we came back to revisit it, and, and we, we had a, they made a fantastic film at the Olympic Stadium in Rome, and uh, off we went. We did it, it. It was a bit less than Led Zeppelin, but it was still it was pretty successful. And the fact that it was 4K, it's a real experience, a real event, because you're not going to be able to get the benefits of 4K even on a 4K television. You need to see it on a big screen. And we're actually going out with that uh, again um, onto IMAX screens as a limited edition release to enhance that experience even further. Has anyone seen 4K? Cool. It if you uh, could you tell the difference raise your hand if you thought you could see it i mean if you're interested you can see it on the floor of costco you know they've uh, and and best buy and many of the consumer electronics stores but what what happens at the end of the day is the um, you have a spectacular number of additional pixels available so um, we're actually going to shoot uh, the jazz fest um, this year in uh, New Orleans, and we're going to shoot the main stage in 4K because everything from the iMag to the uh, television and cinema broadcasts and the like, whether you're seeing it in 4K or not, if it's captured with a 4K camera, you're going to get a much better image, and you'll see it throughout the uh, life of the product. What, a lot of people are going, hmm, 4K or 3D? Well, they're not mutually oh, exclusive. I mean, in in particular, we shot Katy Perry in uh, 4K and in 3D using 4K cameras. So we, you know, we have in essence all formats available. Um, there's currently, I'd say, uh, a little slowdown in 3D at the home level, but the interest in cinema uh, 3D has never been better, um, and we believe that uh, in the long run you're going to. When you see glassless 3D is when you'll see 3D come back into favor in the home. But uh, if you experience 3D, uh, particularly 4K 3D, 
Uh, it's 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 so immersive. I mean, that's really the yeah. the term that it just you 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 feel as though you are really right there in the action. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just wave a little banner and not necessarily disagree, but don't use don't use 3D for the sake of 3D. Make sure that it's an artist that really translates well to the big screen and that you're not using it as a gimmick. Um, because quite honestly, it creates a whole layer of complications and, and consumer, the ex consumer experience, they're going to be disappointed. You know, if it's an artist like a Dave Matthews who's sitting in a, a flannel shirt um, and isn't moving like a Katy Perry is and it's not high effects drama, those create some challenges. So, you know, I, I think from my perspective, really use it in the art form that it's intended and make sure that it really showcases the artist in a, a, a better way instead of using it as a gimmick to get people to come out. The other thing we're finding too is seniors have a challenge with the glasses. Um, and to John's point, until the glasses go away, if you're um, shooting classic rock to an older audience, just be really aware of your audience and, you know, do they have to put glasses on top of glasses um, or is there really a great reason to do it in 3D? I think the, the, the one word that, that I want you to remember in what Kimberly just said is art. At the end of the day, music is art and, and musicians are artists. So it's really about using technology to support the art. As Kimberly says, you know, it, this is not about a tech game here. This is about, you know, using the current, the, the best technical tools to support the artist uh, and, and their art uh, and not uh, drive it or force it in another direction. No 3D flannel shirts. <laughs> Um, Chemical Brothers is, is, is a perfect example of, a, of, of uh, art and music merging. Uh, this was a show that they played at the big uh, Japanese rock festival. Um, and they brought in a, a film director rather than a music video director. And they made a, I don't know if anyone's seen the film, but it, it's, it's, it's pretty special. Um, and that was, we, we set that up by um, doing 20 cities before the, before the general theatrical release. Uh, for fans only, so that key 20 cities around the world a week before theatrical release made tickets available just to fans via their social media channels and, fa and fan club. Uh, and then we came in uh, with, a, with a slightly broader, it wasn't, wasn't super big, it was about 700 screens around the world. Again, we worked with uh, Kimberly in the States on this one. And, and it's still, because of the nature of the film, although it's a concert film, there's a lot of uh, clever trickery and fantasy scenes and so forth in it. Uh, and so it really works as a cinema piece. Cinema piece. I, I've just got an email before I came in here that we're running a season of it in Japan. So th these, these kind of things keep running. And the, uh, the Beatles was also a pretty um, special one. That was shot in, I think, half a K. Um, but they, uh, Apple decided to remaster it um, uh, and re-release it. Um, and they came to us and said, OK, we want to set up something very, very select, very small. So we did a combination there of regular theatrical where we, where we book cinemas and we share the box office, but we also did some four-wall hires, which means basically, we'll talk about that a bit more a bit later, but we go in and hire a cinema and then we control the tickets. So I think we did, it was about nine countries with the Beatles and, and, it, and it worked very well as, as a platform for Apple, not Apple computers, Apple Beatles Apple, um, to, to release the DVD uh, about a month after the cinema screenings. A couple more from uh, Kimberly to wrap up on the case studies. So the Grateful Dead has become a perennial for us. We do it every year, um, and it, it's extremely successful. It's a rabid fan base that we can't stop them from coming. And our theaters love it because concession sales go through the roof, um, <laughs> especially in Colorado. So Grateful Dead, we have about, you know, on average, we're do, holding it about 400 to 500 theaters nationwide. It's a fan meetup. It's truly an experience that Rhino gets completely behind and really activates their fan base. And we bring back something special from the vault. So whether it's an interview with Jerry Garcia or it's a concert um, that hasn't been seen in, in years or maybe there's only a bootleg copy out there, we look for something really special to create that, that fan engagement. Um, numbers continue to go up, so it shows that if we continue to do something, we're building off our fan base. People enjoy the experience, they come back. We started with Grateful Dead. John actually started with an event in 2005, is that right? Yeah, I think it was uh, actually 2004. There's an interesting backstory in that. 
in that it came from the vault, it was out on DVD, and so there were a number of people that said, well, why would anybody come to a movie theater to see this? They already have it in their collection. It's in an old format. We'd have to up it, blah, 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 make a long story short. Spent the money, um, brought it out. The fans came out because what, what, what's really special about the cinema events is the fact that all the fans come out and they celebrate together. The energy and the sense of the community and the tribal nature of music comes together in the cinema uh, uh, auditoriums in a way that no other digital format offers. You know, you can do online and you can do mobile and uh, there's all t kinds of technology to deliver content, but to experience content, you really need to be with, with your friends. And as Kimberly says, mm -hmm. to this day, it continues to draw people out annually to celebrate this together. And then we always stage it either around the days between, we've done 420, we've done, you know, um, the advanced promotion of anniversary product. So everything is done with purpose and it's really to help support the label and what their, their mission is and what their downstream initiatives are. Rolling Stones was the first project that Fathom did with Omniverse. And that was actually our first release as well. Yeah, and so if you can tell, we're all friends up here. I mean, we trust each other. We really support each other. Um, we have Cineplex in the audience. Uh, Matt, if you could raise your hand. Where's Matt? Matt's our partner in Canada. <laughs> um, and, you know, we really collaborate and we brainstorm and we say, okay, does the U.S. want to go on the same date as we're doing worldwide? Does it make sense? As you know, release dates for the U.S. are on Tuesdays. In the U.K., it's Monday. In Australia, it's Friday. Um, so we really collaborate together behind the scenes to find the most optimal opportunity for success. Rolling Stones, I believe we went out to roughly 500 U.S. theaters. It was a global yeah, release. Yeah, about 500, yep. Um, done at the same time worldwide. Grateful Dead did not go um, international. Sometimes programs just aren't as strong internationally, but the Stones definitely were. Um, it was an iconic piece of content. It was back in 1970. It was actually a it was the Texan concert um, shot in 1972, remastered, and we shot a, a, a special piece of content with Mick Jagger to, to front it up to give it a, a, some extra exclusivity and some contemporary, a contemporary angle. Um, and that platformed the DVD release, which came out about four weeks later. But I think at the other end of the extreme, so 41 years later, you shot the Stones in Hyde Park last right. year. In 4K. Right, in 4K, not 3D. And, no uh, you know, that's a spectacular DVD package today. The Rolling Stones, you know, starting with, uh, with Mick Jagger and everyone in their organization just have a spectacular uh, understanding of their fan and the fan experience, and they have always embraced and uh, uh, challenged um, technology uh, to give their fans the best experience they can with their performances. So, I'm a big fan of light bulb moments, and I just wanted to share my light bulb moment about why I got into this business. Um, uh, about five years ago, my, a good friend who's now my business partner said, you've got to come along and see this show, and he'd been involved in producing it, and it was the Foo Fighters uh, from Wembley Arena. And it was, uh, he took me to a cinema in, uh, in the West End of London, the View Cinema on Leicester Square. And uh, I, was, I was kind of a little sceptical, to be honest, anyway. Can we go into the cinema? And there's about, it's quite a big, big room, about four or 500 people. And it was packed. And so as the film played, it was like, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. There's 400 Foo Fighter fans here. The sound is extraordinary. The, the, you're up close. You're very personal. And I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, the likelihood is if I was at Wembley Arena, I'd be sitting somewhere up in the bleachers, I think you call them. Um, maybe watching it on a screen, sound would be kind of okay, and I'd have paid 100 bucks for a ticket. And that was, yeah, fuck, this is great, I like this, let's, let's do this. And that, that, that's how the business came to, came to be, with the, the light bulb moment, and I think Kimberly probably has one as well. I have a few, you know, I, I learn on every project. Some are, are great successes, and others I go back and look and scratch my head and say, they had 10 million fans, why couldn't they drive attendance? Um, you know, so I have a lot of light bulb moments. I think the one that I'm most proud of, and I'm going to change from what I said this morning, was when John and I collaborated on Bon Jovi. And we decided that for the first time we were going to try to do texting in movie theaters where fans across the country could text in questions to a bridge. And we were sitting in New York and, you know, Bon Jovi was there and they were answering questions from cinemas around the country. And to me, that was what this 
was all about. That was the holy grail of what these events could be, that fans could actually reach out and in real time have their questions answered if they were sitting in Omaha, Nebraska, or Des Moines, Iowa. It was a magic moment for sure. I mean, uh, when, you're, when you're interacting live, live with uh, fans and the artists uh, themselves, it's, it's, it's spectacular. And when Grant asked me the question, I, I thought of, uh, I guess a couple came to mind, Prince when we gave away CDs with the, uh, uh, with the ticket purchase for the cinemas and actually uh, we scared uh, the sound scan people to change the rules that you couldn't, those were no longer uh, scannable units. When Garth Brooks came out and uh, after 11 years of retirement uh, decided to play live live in movie theaters uh, after an 11 night run at the Sprint Center in Kansas City and we saw two nights sell out and we saw all these t-shirts that have been in drawers for 10 plus years come out uh, to celebrate when fish fans uh, sat uh, in theaters across the United States to go live from uh, Keyspan Park in New York including a theater in uh, Manhattan where uh, we had a thunderstorm uh, come over the theater and for 20 minutes we lost the video signal and no one left. Um, but I guess the one where, you know, and, and I think the promoters and the artists and people that are in the live music business will appreciate this, um, you're going to see uh, probably Coldplay at uh, the uh, ACL Live Moody Theater um, in the next night or two and, you know, big bands and little rooms. So we had Coldplay in the movie theaters to premiere their first DVD. And I'm at one of the theaters, and in particular, I'm standing outside and I'm watching people reselling tickets. Which and I can't even. They, they, were, they were reselling their tickets at a higher price than face. And I said to myself, well, having been a promoter my whole life, if people are scalping these tickets, we are really in for a good run here. So have, have, have a think about this. We, as you all know, live in a, a hyper-connected world. I think there's something like 4.9 4 billion connected devices in the world today. Interestingly, there's only 4.2 billion toothbrushes. Um, that's, somebody told me that last week. In, in a couple of years' time, there's going to be 50 billion. <laughs> 50 billion connected devices. So what, what, what does that mean? That means that we've got an abundance of content. We've got an abundance of, uh, of connectivity. We've got abundance of noise. And we've got a scarcity of engagement, of, uh, of deep experience, of filters. So we kind of think at cinema is, is, as we've sort of touched on along, along the discussion so far, a way of filtering that and, and making you commit, making you engage, and making you spend, making you if you want to, obviously, uh, two hours with, with your favourite artist rather than kind of watching, uh, watching three minutes on Vimeo. So I just, I just wanted to share that with you. You know, I think, that. too, it, it, it's what we said earlier. It's a communal experience. I think that consumers want to consume content where they consume it, whether it, it's flat screen, at home, by themselves. Some want to rally together and, and share that experience. And I think if you create great content that has a complete life cycle so that it starts maybe in cinema and then it, it goes to Internet and it, it hits audiences where they really want to consume content, then you have a perfect trifecta. Um, so when you're thinking about creating content, think all the way through, you know, how long can this content last? I mean, we talked about some programs today that were produced 30, 40 years ago, and they still hold up to their fans. So if, if your producers and directors out there are students that are looking to get into this business, think about the long term and the long, tra long tail strategy of that content. I think the other thing that, that's really important that, that kind of completes the circle here is when you market this content. You, the, the cinema trailers and the posters in the, in the theaters um, are great uh, to give it a Hollywood effect, but at the end of the day, the tickets are sold by social media, they're sold by uh, email blast to the fan base, they're sold by local market radio promotions, local market print. It's really a, 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 it's a grassroots, almost a club type uh, concert engagement promotion. You can't look at this as a Hollywood release because at the end of the day is you want the same energy that you would have in a small club for a major artist performance, which is what you have here, you know, um, uh, as opposed to a Hollywood feature. It's a, 
Sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say that's a huge point because we don't require P&A spends at Fathom, but we do look at, you know, what's the band going to do to get behind this? Because we're only as good as them touching out and reaching their fans. And if they work really hard and, you know, they create a special sizzle reel or do something like Grant said with Rolling Stones doing something in front of the content, it really makes fans feel like they're being personally invited. And that's, that's the key. Um, you know, if uh, anybody here from Warner, anybody in the audience from Warner? Um, we did Josh Groban about a year ago, and Josh was amazing. He cut special little videos that went out in social media inviting fans to come. Um, he did something from the iconic Lincoln Center area and was constantly engaging with his fans on Facebook and Twitter. And it really moved the meter and made a difference. And that's the kind of engagement we look for at Fathom when we, we suss out music events. I mentioned 12 million fans. You know, if somebody has a million fans or even less and they're willing to really do the work to, to invite their fans, mm -hmm. and that can be a very, very successful event. And, okay. and uh, just one uh, add on to that. And that's really important that the artist is completely engaged because we all know that artists, some of them are all over this. And some of them are like, well, I don't do that. Well, if you don't do that, if you don't really want to put your, your stamp of approval on this event, then this is probably not the right don't type of yeah, media right. event for you. But when you take an artist like Bon Jovi, when he had just uh, finished uh, one record-breaking uh, uh, Billboard number one tour, and he wanted to release new music, and he wanted to, in essence, put another leg of the tour on sale, he came out to engage live in real time with fans Q&A. Mm. And, and that made it very special and the fans came out. I saw a, a great event last week, it was in the States I think as well, I, I wasn't um, uh, professionally involved with it, but uh, it was Gold Frap, I don't know if anyone saw it in the States here last week. But it, it, it worked really well for me because I'm a Gold Frap fan, they don't tour, they did a, they'd, they'd made a um, they'd made a, a film which was really kind of four uh, four long form music videos, and they went to Air Studios, which is this amazing um, studio where they record a lot of uh, orchestras in London. It's an old church, so they created a cinema event and they played the half hour film, and they had a golf rap played, and it was it was just very up close, and it was it was it was something that I knew I wouldn't be able to go and see golf rap probably for maybe in a year or two, they tour every few years. And that, that was a really engaging um, experience. A, a very good example of this on, 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 you know, on, on a fairly, let's call it boutique-y kind of a level. Um, so we've, we just started touching on, on, on some of these things with Kimberly just, just now, but um, I'll just kick off by talking about how we uh, market and promote our releases outside of the US and then we'll go into uh, what Fathom does because they, they've, they've got a sort of a particular, let's call it a very effective machine. <coughs> we don't have a machine as such because we're dealing with many, many different exhibitors in many different countries. Um, but the, 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 the two foundations are, as we've touched on, the engagement of the artist. Um, but the in-cinema advertising and promotion is, 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 has, has got great value for, um, for both selling cinema tickets and for platforming other product that may be coming out later. So basically what that means is that we collect, make, edit and distribute um, 30 and 60 second trailers to all our cinema partners and that's in with Led Zeppelin, that was in 60 territories for example, with Muse I think it was about 45. So we repurpose them where necessary for different languages and we do the same with poster art. So basically what we're getting in most cinemas is 30 days of, of uh, marketing on screen trailers, um, posters in the lobby and then increasingly important is the database marketing of the exhibitors. The more, that they, the more of these they've done, obviously the more people that they can talk to very specifically. So if they've got 350,000 people that went to see a Led Zeppelin film and we're releasing Muse, there's a certain amount of crossover there. If it's a Rolling Stones, maybe there's a bit more. So that becomes more and more effective. We then work very closely to, to make media partnerships happen. We might be working with a record company across multiple territories. We might be working with a local PR person that we will have hired. Uh, and we will look to partner with radio stations, <coughs> with local music and print media, um, to do ticket giveaways um, if it warrants it uh, a, 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 a larger kind of competition, maybe a travel prize or something like that. 
can, can you give us a bit of a rundown on how the Fathom sure. we, um, well-oiled machine works? You know, we have a brilliant marketing team. They've been doing this for years. They really know what they're doing, and they know how to do a lot with a little. Um, I think the first thing that we've already mentioned, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, is really looking at the band assets, looking at what the talent is willing to bring to the table, how strong their social media is. I pull clout scores on everyone, for those of you. Um, that know or don't know, a clout score is, is how relevant they are at any given time in social media. And I look for scores that are 80 plus. Um, and then I, I look at aggregate, you know, how many Twitter um, followers they have, Facebook, et cetera. That's the core. Then we also fill in with, instead of buying traditional media, because you all know it's very expensive, we leverage our relationships. So it's USA Today, it's Billboard Magazine, it's RollingStone.com. All the fans of Fathom that continually write about um, our events, we you know engage them. We issue a, a national press release, and we let the press machine kind of do its its magic to fill in on the that um, aspect. We also have a private ticketing window, and this is really big for music. Um, it goes back to that exclusivity of, wow, I'm getting something special and unique. So if the band has a fan base, we'll go out maybe 48 hours prior to public ticketing and allow that fan base to, to buy tickets in advance. And then that generally goes viral. They let their friends know, and that's a good problem to have. Um, 30 days of promotion on screen, we do two. We do 30s. Not 60s, I wish we did 60s. We do 60s. Um, we do 30s in what's called segment three. And if you guys have been to the movie theaters and have seen First Look, anybody here see you held captive at the movie theater and you watch our promotions? Um, that's about 15 minutes prior to state of movie start time. And then there's another spot, which is a 20 second digital trailer, which we don't even sell. And that's right after Coke and right before the actual studio trailers. And that's about two minutes before stated movie start time. So you're getting, you know, 98% of the audience is in their seats and they're able to see that trailer. We look at those as really reinforcing the messaging. So they maybe have gotten an email blast or there's a window cling at the box office and they've seen the Grateful Dead window claim at point of purchase, and it just reminds them if they're leaving the theater to make sure they get their tickets in advance. Um, we kind of also monitor throughout the project. We put tickets on sale about four weeks prior, and we compare it to other events. How's it trending? How's the pre-sales going? Is there something going on that you know is preventing pre-sales from being so strong so that we can flex on a dime and change our marketing strategy if we need to over the course of those four weeks? John, do you, uh, have you got anything to say in terms of uh, content and sponsors, bringing sponsors in at an early stage in the production process? I think that uh, sponsors can bring uh, a number of advantages. Uh, obviously, uh, they uh, can write a check, which can help you uh, create the content, uh, but can also, uh, in essence, support an artist tour or uh, other initiatives uh, that the artist uh, might have going at that time. Um, secondly, time's up. And probably, <laughs> uh, probably um, as important, if not more important, they can bring media partners. They can bring, you know, sponsors in particular have um, media budgets that are already committed. And so that if they can turn that inventory over to you to, in essence, uh, support. The, the other advertising that's going on, that can, that can be spectacular. They can also bring you retail partners where you can activate um, uh, through retail outlets and you can do bounce backs where, you know, you have a value add to the cinema ticket that includes uh, $5 off or go pick the new CD up uh, in store or something like that. <clears throat> so there's really, you know, I, I think you have to look at it as marketing partnerships and, um, you know, when you really get lucky and you get way out front, uh, you can also monetize it through that channel as well. So, again, we, we've, we've touched on a few of these, but make, making a rock movie immersive is, is, is obviously absolutely crucial to make it, making it successful. Um, these are the, some of the things, and, and we've talked about some of them, but uh, interactive live Q&As happen a lot. Uh, they work very well. Um, we do them with Twitter and all the, the usual channels that you would expect. Um, uh, behind the scenes footage, so that kind of speaks for itself. It might be live, it might be, be post-produced as part of a recorded film. Um, 
uh, targeted welcome messaging. We did, we did a in really interesting one, which was which very simple, very small, but worked incredibly well. We did a Robbie Williams live broadcast from a stadium in Estonia. We went to 900 cinemas, um, and we did this promotion in the UK and Germany, which um, basically we, we went to local radio stations, and people entered a competition to have Robbie say hi to them at their local cinema. Kind of simple. Um, we obviously had to get Robbie Williams to agree to it, which he did. Um, and the, the media that generated us was extraordinary. And then, you know, come there, he's in Estonia, and halfway through the set he goes, hi, Rachel and friends at uh, the Odeon in Birmingham. And it was, hey, oh, that's easy, but fantastic. Um, unusual locations. John, you'd be the expert on unusual locations. Uh, we just, you know, shot uh, Jennifer Lopez in 3D at the start of her... Uh at the start of her uh, European tour in Lisbon. And so, you know, in particular, uh, J-Lo in Lisbon resonates with her Latin heritage, but it also speaks to an international audience. And so, you know, the, the idea uh, behind unusual location is, you know, manageable from a cost perspective, as well as uh, you can weave a story around it that is, that, um, uh, is, is genuine. Uh, from the artist's perspective. And we're looking for venue series, you know, to, to do something. We, we did Def Leppard um, from Las Vegas, from the joint in Las Vegas, and there's a continuity there. So if you, if you come out of, you know, the joint or you come out of the Apollo Theater um, and you put acts that resonate with that venue, then that makes a really great series for us at Fathom. Um, exclusive fan screenings, there was an example I gave of the Chemical Brothers, which, uh, which, which can be a, a great way to activate the fan base. Um, and that kind of leads neatly onto the, obviously, the fan engagement. Um, and it's, it's all, you know, very obvious, very, very straightforward stuff. But you, you, need to, you need to get the artist and the management and the record company to really buy into the process and, and understand um, that this is, a, this is a kind of a first window. So we're releasing a film into cinemas. Um, the DVD might be coming in typically four week, minimum of four weeks time. You have a you have an uh, in various different territories you, 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 to, to to get the theatrical distribution you need. You, you need to not have the DVD coming too close. Generally speaking, that's a whole political hot pot which I don't think we'll go into now. That's a separate panel. Um, I think we we've, we've got ten minutes left, so maybe we can um, uh, see if we have some questions um, from the floor that we'd uh, I'd answer. As the cinema experience keeps getting better, is there concern from artists and promoters that that sorry, is there concern from artists and promoters that the cinema experience might start cannibalizing sales from actual concerts? I know this is a con this is a concern in the U.S. with sports teams. As the TV home experience gets better and better, people will stop going to games. Is that all a concern in this industry? I think the uh, statistics, if you start with sports. As uh, television distribution has gotten wider and better, they just sell more tickets at a higher price. And in particular, the marketing values of intelligently uh, shot, marketed, and delivered uh, cinema experiences and digital content from tours, all it does is sell tickets. We did some exit polls, um, at a, I can't remember what it was recently, um, and found that 66% of the people that were watching this concert in the cinema had been to the live show a month before. So it's kind of, which I was very surprised, pleasantly. We've done, we've done the same thing on Broadway, and if, if a tour is, you know, we're, we're precluding a, a tour that's going out, that people seem more vested, they want to come see it live, they feel like they have that insider scoop because of all the behind the scenes and they're dragging their friends to go. So about 65% say, when it comes to my city, I actually want to see it live. So we think that all boats rise if we do it right. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this focus has been on theater, but I was wondering if any of you had experience with uh, digital only, a digital as an online only release, and if that has a similar pop for I've, I've Yeah, I've produced um, hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, bands' performances in uh, webcasts, you know, primarily festivals, um, but individual artists' webcasts as well. We've actually done a few uh, webcast events adjacent to uh, Fathom. Um, 
and, and, and they, they do provide a good experience and they provide uh, a good marketing value, but the, the reality is that if you're online or if you're on mobile, you don't have the shared experience of being in a room with 200 people and feeling that energy. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I think that's what we're saying is that, in particular, if you look at the hierarchy of, uh, of media exhibition for an event like this, and you go cinemas, and you go online, and you go mobile, and you go television, and you go DVD, and you know, then you uh, go in and chop it up in clips and things like that. All of those windows exist, and all of them can coexist, and they can support each other. Um, but I think, in particular, what the what the cinemas do that the other ones don't is they give you that immersive, collective, tribal feeling about a music event uh, um, that, that other forms of digital media, in my experience, don't. I remember provide. having a conversation with you, Kimberly, about pay-per-view versus cinema, and it was, it was actually a sporting event, but it, it was very much, okay, you have an option. You can, you can stay home, you can pay whatever it is, 50 bucks for a pay-per-view um, and bring all your friends around, or you can pay 10 bucks each and you go to the cinema and have a slightly different experience. It's the sort of in-home or out-of-home choice. I mean, and, and, and the other thing, uh, just to follow up on Grant's point there, you can also go to sports bars, but if you're a parent and you, in essence, you know, you want to you want to enjoy a boxing match with, uh, let's say, your young children, um, then then it, the cinemas provide a safe environment that is family friendly, you know, in particular in that instance, that's different than the experience in the sports bar where smoking and other things are, you know, going on. Not to say that there's anything wrong with each of the platforms. But the, the important thing to understand is what does each platform do that's different than the others and how does that make it special and different? And we, I handle the, the Golden Boy events with Floyd Mayweather and that's a really good point because a lot of people can't even get pay-per-view. So the audience you know, that comes to movie theaters isn't cannibalizing those that would buy pay-per-view. They're the one-off the one father and son. They're the person that's on a cash basis with their cable. Um, and we're introducing new audiences. And, and if you remember the roots of boxing, it was closed circuit back in 1976. We're just getting back to the roots of, of what makes it exciting for fight fans. This lady down here in the second row, third row. Yes. Yeah. Hi. I, th I think that I think there is. I mean, I think the opportunities of what we we can do are multiplying uh, exponentially every month. Um, and it, it, going back to a, we've got we've got an increasingly large audience to speak to. We've got um, exhibitors um, getting very kind of creative about marketing special events. So sure, I mean, we're we're working on a, a classic rock thing at the moment. I, it's not short form, but I think the the principle is that you're gathering together and curating some great content. So yeah, very much so. Yeah, I agree, you know, for Fathom that the minimum length of content has to be 90 minutes. So if we stack something together and we create an 80s experience, which you must have been at our dinner last night because we were kind of yeah. <laughs> talking about that, um, then, then yeah, as long as it fits that requirement, it's got to be about the length of a movie because our ticket prices are a little higher premium price, anywhere from $12.50 to $18. Um, so people expect when they come to a movie theater that they're going to be entertained for 90 minutes plus. Hey, uh, my name is Ben Bruce. I'm here from Microsoft, and uh, this was pretty great. It was a great conversation. Cool. Um, one of the things I was I was interested in is you keep talking about the tribal nature and the is it is it a film or a concert? And what I'm getting at here is you mentioned the Grateful Dead. So when the 500 fans come, are you seeing a shakedown street appear, and are people spinning in the aisles, or are they all sitting and watching the movie together? That's a great question, you know, and that was question, another yeah. that was another, another aha light bulb moment. moment. <laughs> um, they're actually engaging with the screen, you know. They're they're clapping, they're getting up, they're dancing. You know, every auditorium is different, so the energy in in an auditorium in you know Des Moines might be different than an auditorium in L.A. But in general, those fans really engage with each other and, you know, they're looking for each other and, and the iconic videos and they're doing meetups in the parking lots. Although, you know, we 
it, it's, it's challenging because our theaters don't own those parking lots. So we really try to discourage them meeting up at the movie theater except for the experience and then maybe doing something afterwards um, off campus somewhere. But they are really, you know, and they're clapping. And that was an aha moment for me. I went to see Clapton Crossroads, the very first one, and I'm like, does it really matter what we do? You know, do fans get it? And I sat there as a fan, and people were clapping and cheering on and saying, wow, that was a really great set. And they were talking to each other. And I was like, this is what makes it all worthwhile. You know, and, and because honestly, a lot of people couldn't get to Chicago to see Clapton Crossroads. But what we were bringing them was an exceptional experience and, and something that they were talking about to other fans. It was, we, we did a, a, the final gig of a band called Facele Faithless um, uh, live into a bunch of cinemas in Europe. And uh, it was very funny because I was, I was at one and people were getting up and dancing. They were going down the front, they were dancing in the aisles. So that uh, the next day there were all these emails from different cinemas and half of them were going, wow, that was amazing. Everyone was getting up and dancing. And the other half were going, what the fuck? They were ripping up the seats and like, we can't have this. It's now well, an R rating because he's a deal. But, but I think what's, what's really important and, and in, in what they're saying is that you actually spend time with the local staff, that you tell the cinemas, this is the crowd that's coming, and embrace dancing and embrace clapping and cheering and a, a, a much more dynamic interaction with the screen than you know what you're used to with a Hollywood feature. And, and, and the fans come in with the expectation that they're going to, to, to behave in the way that they would behave at a, um, uh, at a concert event uh, other than the fact that you can't smoke. That's a good point too. And our cinemas are, are prepped you know, 48 hours ahead of time. So, you know, and we'll have instructions like, turn up the sound, this is a concert, you know, just a reminder. And they really care. They want it to be a great experience. Um, and, you know, and, and we also have VIP locations. We'll let them know if band management or band, you know, members are going to be there or family members. And they really want to know those details and they want to make sure that it is an immersive experience for the fans that do come out to these events. And we do uh, uh, one other uh, thing with the content preparation. We actually do a special audio mix to take advantage not only of the spatial dimensions of the audio, but the volume capacity of the cinema sound system so that you have consistent volume throughout the auditorium. Yeah. Any more questions? Good, good morning. Hi. Good morning. Um, a, as a follow-up to the discussion on uh, events being immersive in cinema and, and the, the film versus concert question, I'm wondering if there's a priority on your end as far as being able to go after uh, cataloger and or remastered content versus going after uh, live content with either new bands or older bands that, that are still performing? Um, from my perspective, I, I'd always lean towards the, 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 the new, just because it's, there's a value to something that hasn't been seen before. Um, at the same time, we, 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 we're looking to sort of create packages and series of, of stuff that might be culled from you know, archives or already be available and seen. You know, I'm, I, I, I keep a bit of a, I'm very open, and I, I want to see, you know, is the content that's being offered to us iconic? Is it tied to an anniversary? Does it make sense? You know, live concerts always perform or generally perform better because it's that live experience. But, you know, I'm open to it. Springsteen and I was a project that we did last summer and did it across three play dates. And it was wildly successful. Now, if you're a Springsteen fan, I don't know how many of you got to see that, you're really going to enjoy something like that, and, and you've got to look at it from the lens of a fan, where having the iconic um, performance video of, of Bruce performing throughout his career was what really drove that. So having a Bruce Springsteen live concert versus that, I would say that one probably would have won out. Um, so we keep an open mind and we really look at it at a fresh lens. I will counsel everyone in here, make sure that the rights are cleared and the, you know, you've got all the clearances and all the, and we can help you with that and John's a master at that. Um, but you just want to make sure you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's so we don't have an aha moment and have to pull down um, an event because it wasn't properly cleared if we're mm. using older footage. Thank you, Matt. My, my, my view on that is I'm looking for marketable content where we can access the fan and actually from a purchasing perspective, you're more likely 
the older the demographic, the more likely they are to buy tickets to cinema events. That's true. So on your... Oh. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just... Um, as far as you touched on it a minute ago, Grant, as far as the uh, acquisition, the pay models, you, you said that there's a shared box versus a yep. four wall. Um, it, are most of your acquisitions done on a shared box? Yes. Or? Yeah. Okay. And then are you, you mentioned the Monday through Thursday. Do you, uh, there was a UFC event a few years ago, I believe, that touched on the weekends. Do you, do you limit to Monday through Thursday? No, or do I you mean, go funnily enough, we were going to do a UFC event on the last Saturday, uh, which we, we didn't because there were complications with the television rights. Um, we don't. We, we, we have a, I think we have a little bit more flexibility um, than, than Fathom do, although we have done a Sunday event with Fathom. It just it, uh, What that meant to us and, and, and to, to Kimberley was that the cinemas kept a little bit more of the, uh, more of the box office than they would on a Monday to Thursday. We so can there always is flexibility. Pitch it. We, we certainly can, but the splits do change for weekends, so it, it puts a lot of financial pressure um, on all of us to make it successful. If it's a simulcast event like boxing, you, you can't show boxing after the fact, so that's why we do, we do the simulcast on the weekends. Um, but it's, it's really limited to sports. As a producer, I would say that it's a better fan experience Monday to Thursday because the fans come in and they take over the entire theater complex. There's generally more people in the event auditorium than in the collective, you know, uh, other auditorium showing Hollywood features. So, you know, if, if you have the choice, the money is better and the fan experience is better midweek. And we found that at Fathom too. Film releases are Fridays. So we could lose audience that comes and expects to see The Grateful Dead, but oh my goodness, here's this blockbuster that just got released, I wanna see that instead. And we also found that people have a lot um, of pressure on their schedules on the weekends, where during the week we really become a destination. Cool. Yeah, who's got, who's got the microphone? Gentleman in, in, in the middle. Uh, one, one, I don't have okay. We're out of time. Oh, we're out of time. You, you can come up and ask us afterwards if you like. We've got time for yeah, one just, more. Just, yeah, I, I came from 8,000 miles, so. Uh, I'm from Portugal, Welcome. so yeah, thank you. I'm from Portugal, so you were uh, talking about uh, J-Lo at uh, Lisbon. Right. So, yeah, I was there. Um, awesome. Uh, I'm a director. Uh, I've been shooting uh, live concerts for 12 years now. I have done, I don't know, maybe 20 plus live concerts from SD, HD, 2K, 4K, uh, whatever. The thing is, producing or shooting uh, live concerts with quality, it's expensive. And I'm talking about my market because Portugal is like this size, you know. Um, it's very difficult to monetize uh, on top of that. Uh, televisions don't pay for that kind of content. Uh, cinemas, uh, it's very difficult. So how can we think? We, we, I'm always trying to think uh, 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 out of the box and trying to, you know, getting way, new ways to monetize. But um, what do you think? It's uh, quality first, monetize after, or is there? Do you only monetize on cinema, or you put your content uh, anywhere else? Thank I you. I think you have to produce the program that you can pay for and you, you can't uh, produce or you can't attempt to produce a program that everyone won't be proud having their name on it. You know, I, I think in particular because we were in Portugal and because we were rehearsing for the beginning of the tour, we were able to capture that experience on a very high level for a relatively modest budget. In the case when we shot Katy Perry, you know, we knew that it was an important uh, uh, performance for her, it was the end of, the, uh, of that tour. We shot it in 3D and we had a business model that said it was gonna go out through uh, uh, event cinema with Fathom and uh, uh, Grant and people like that. Um, but at the end of the day, it was so good that Paramount bought it. So, and you never know, you know, and then from Katie's perspective, not only did Paramount buy it, but their uh, summer release, G.I. Joe, got pushed back six months and Katie became the Paramount movie for that summer, which was spectacular and is continuing to pay her dividends with her new tour right now. So 
I would say as a content guy at heart, you can't do something that is less than, than what you and the artist are gonna you know, really yeah. be excited about. Um, but you gotta figure out how to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we're probably out of time, are we? Yeah. Thank you very much, Thanks, everybody. Everyone.